The purpose of this video is to help you prepare to take Proxer's SDE Java examination. SDE Java is a Proxer authentic examination that tests the ability of a person to perform job-related tasks by performing those exact same tasks in the context of a proctored exam. The purpose of the SDE Java exam is to determine the readiness of an individual to enter the field of professional software development. Exam takers are required to fix defects and add functionality to working software, much as they will be doing every day on the job. Before you register for SDE Java, you should be a programmer. You should be familiar with variables, arrays, loops, lists, conditionals, functions, procedures, methods, compound data types, classes, and methods. You should be familiar with traversing, sorting, and searching data, and with file input and output. And you should be familiar with recursion and recursive calls. Courses designed to teach introductory and intermediate programming are available from many universities, colleges, training institutes, and various online resources. The SDE Java exam requires the use of Java. Currently, we use version 1.7. When taking the exam, you will not be able to search the web for code examples or tutorials. However, the exam environment contains a language reference for Java and the standard edition API specification, uh, so you will have documentation you can refer to. It would be a good idea to familiarize yourself with that documentation uh, before starting the exam. Although we use Java, many exam takers who know other languages but are new to Java are able to do quite well on the exam. The SDE Java exam is based on three classes that you should know about. Spreadsheet is a functioning spreadsheet application. CSV Reader is a class that reads comma-separated value files. And CSV Writer is a class that writes comma-separated value or CSV files. There are currently 13 tasks based on this code, and you will be given a total of four tasks to solve over a total time of six hours. The spreadsheet application has an explanatory video, as do each of these 13 tasks that you might be asked to solve. Videos are accessible for preparation ahead of the exam, and you can watch the videos from within the exam environment during the exam administration. In addition, each task has an associated project directory that has been set up to work in Eclipse, in NetBeans, or in BlueJay, uh, which are all different integrated development environments for Java programming. There are also different language versions of the exam for English, Spanish, and Chinese currently. And a detailed description of each task is given in a README file, which you can find in any of the project directories. Besides Eclipse, NetBeans, and BlueJay, you can use a variety of text editors, including Emacs, VI, Nano, Jed, and Gedit. All of these are included in the exam environment, as are the standard command line tools that you might be familiar with if you use Linux. Uh, for example, grep for searching uh, files for strings, find for searching files, uh, cd ls for directory listings, and on and on. Let's talk about what you need to learn. People who have a good background in one or more object-oriented languages such as Python, C++, C Sharp, Object Pascal, should have little trouble developing a working knowledge of Java by reading and modifying the base code of the exam while trying to solve a few of the tasks. During the pre-examination learning phase, it's fine to use the internet and consult with other people to see how others address specific issues. And in fact, we recommend working with a, a friend, a partner, uh, who can uh, read your code and, and give comment, and you can read their code and give them comments and learn together. If you have no background in object-oriented programming, Proxer recommends taking a course ahead of taking the SDE Java exam, 
After all, this is a real programming situation and you will need to develop code in a fairly efficient manner. Before the exam, you should also decide on a development environment and then use it to practice implementing a few tasks. If you're an experienced Java developer, you probably have a favorite IDE and a, a method of working. Um, almost everyone who has taken SDE Java has done so using either NetBeans or Eclipse. Uh, we have also installed static analysis tools, FindBugs, PMD, and JLint, and these really do identify issues in programs, so it's worth becoming familiar with how to use them to identify problems in source code. Let's take a look now at some of the base code. Java CSV makes it easy to read and write comma-separated value files. Uh, this library contains both the uh, CSV Reader class and CSV Writer class. So let's go open up some code and take a look. We're going to open the SDE Java study.zip file. We'll unpack it and look inside the directory, and we see that there are uh, multiple subdirectories for different languages. We'll open up English, and we see that in each language there's a BlueJ version, a NetBeans Projects version, and a workspace for Eclipse. We're going to open the workspace, and we see that there's a directory for each programming task and a few other directories. We're going to open Eclipse and give it the workspace that we were just looking at as a starting location and we'll wait for Eclipse to fire up here and take a look. It will take Eclipse a few seconds to uh, try to compile all of these projects and produce some uh, warning and error messages. Uh, you can ignore the warnings that are up here for now and you'll see a couple of projects down there that have errors. That's because the task involves completing some code in order to make the code compile. We're going to look now at the Java CSV library. This is some base code that you'll be using in a number of different tasks inside the source directory and then com.csv reader. Uh, we see the actual source code, so we'll double click on csvreader.java and take a look. As open source projects go, uh, this is a fairly small collection of code. However, there's still entirely too much detail for you to try to simply read the code and understand how it works. However, the Java CSV classes are commented in conformance with the Java doc standard, and this means that uh, we have an HTML API description generated automatically from the source code for the classes CSV Reader and CSV Writer. So the recommended way to use the API is navigate to its root from a browser and uh, so let's find that documentation here. Back in the workspace directory we use the file browser to go to the uh, Java CSV directory Inside that we find doc, and inside doc we look for index.html, and we'll just open that up in a browser. Okay, once the API is opened, it shows the two classes as links. Clicking on a link for either class brings up the fields, constructors, and other methods of the class. Any of these elements can be viewed in detail by clicking on the links. It's important to use the API rather than to read the code because the API provides the correct level of abstraction for a client of the code. You will not be modifying the CSV Reader or CSV Writer. So look at the API for CSV Reader. There are seven different constructors. Pouring through the code to determine why there are so many constructors and determining which is appropriate for use in various task solutions is the wrong way to go about things. Just a cursory look at the API makes it easy to understand that the constructors are there to deal with commonly used data sources, a file, a reader, an input stream, uh, character sets, and explicit column delimiter. 
A more detailed look at any of the fields or methods is just a click away. Spreadsheet.java was written by Proxer. Many of the tasks of SDE Java require modifications to Spreadsheet.java. Therefore, it's important to understand how this class is put together, and you should spend some time on it. Although there are comments, the comments here do not conform to Javadoc. That's not so important because here you really need to understand and modify program internals rather than treat it as a black box with an abstract API. Modern development environments support the programmer with views and perspectives, so we will exploit that. Open spreadsheet.java in Eclipse. It will open to the Java perspective. Close the Package Explorer and then size the code and outline view so both are readable. Move through the Spreadsheet class by clicking on fields, classes, and methods that are defined within it by clicking on elements of the outline view. Comments are at the top of each entity and give the programmer a good idea of the structure of the spreadsheet and its elements. Click on Spreadsheet in the outline view. In the comments and the declarations, you learn that the spreadsheet is an array of cell objects holding formulas and another array of text fields for display. The spreadsheet is a fixed size. You can also read about cells and formulas. Note that the program operates mainly on cell objects and only uses text fields for display. Setting a text field directly will not change the contents of cells and will probably lead to bad values being computed and displayed down the line. The methods that perform spreadsheet arithmetic are easy to spot and are distinct in that these methods are protected. It is daunting to see that there are three distinct methods with evaluate in the name. Uh, parsing clearly plays a role here. Uh, you should take a look at these. Getting and setting cell values is important. There are a flock of methods dealing with action listeners and some stuff dealing with the graphical user interface. At this point, knowing that all this is available is important. Knowing the details of each is not. Fixing your attention on the comments about spreadsheet makes sense. Your attention should remain fixed on those comments until you understand what they are telling you in terms of program structure. Here are some things you should know about Spreadsheet's implementation. How is the spreadsheet updated? What happens when a formula refers to an out-of-date cell during the update process? How are self-referential formulas detected? How are cycles among multiple formulas detected? Why are there two representations of each cell? Well, here's something to think about. A cell can contain an editable formula, yet it has to display the value of that formula. So if you think about these questions and, and uh, read the code and come up with answers to them, then I think you will have a pretty good idea of the general structure of the spreadsheet, and you'll be ready to make changes to the spreadsheet when you need to. So speaking of changes to the spreadsheet, let's look at a task. Uh, we're going to look at the task named Average SS. The SS here refers to spreadsheet. And when you go looking at tasks, the, pl the right place to start is readme.txt. Uh, this is the complete specification for the task. If you meet the specification, you'll get a great grade. If you fail to meet that specification, uh, you, points will be deducted. There are videos available to help illustrate the main points of these tasks, but all of the details are in the README files. Let's take a look at the README for Average SS. Uh, it begins by saying modify spreadsheet.java so that a formula can compute the average of either a row or a column. And the syntax is equal avg uh, open parenthesis cell 1 colon cell 2 close parenthesis where cell 1 and cell 2 are the first and last cells of the row or column data to be averaged. 
So from this, you should get a pretty good idea of what's, what's the problem and what, what do you need to do. Now, there are things that Spreadsheet knows how to do with respect to its cells. Namely, it knows how to add, subtract, multiply, divide. So this task is to extend the collection to include averaging. And here are some hints on how to get started. First ask, where does the program determine if the input is a scalar cell value or a formula? Well, how would you even find that? Um, formulas all start with an equal sign, and so you might search the source code for a string starting with equal, or a character equal, and see if you can find some code related to uh, formula parsing. How does the program determine what to do with a formula? Well, if we find the code, we can, we can read it and see how formulas are, the, the arithmetic formulas are parsed. Uh, can I implement and test that I have this right? Well, you could think about making some changes to the code, perhaps printing some values as the code executes, or using the debugger to set breakpoints and uh, see if you understand what's going on. Let's continue looking at the readme.txt file. If C1 and C2 are within either a row or column of numbers, compute and return the average. Now that you know where to place your code, how do you compute the average? Well, the main idea is to average the values in a row or a column. Uh, so we need to know exactly what cells are going to be averaged, what is the algorithm to compute an average, and how do you make sure that you have this right? So those are some good questions to think about. And we can continue uh, reading the README. It gets a little more detailed, and I urge you to read these uh, specifications very carefully. They tend to be fairly dense, uh, but every word is important. Are there tricky cases you need to work out? Well, yes, there are some tricky cases. So take the cases one at a time, consider them, and uh, start by implementing the, the general easy case, and then uh, look at your code and make sure the special cases are all considered. To test your solution, you can simply run and manually exercise your program. Uh, so let's try running the spreadsheet program here in Eclipse. Okay, now I can type in some values and a formula, and I can see what happens. Well, this is not doing the right thing, so we need some, to do some more work. You should also run a built-in JUnit test. Every task has a built-in JUnit test provided for you. It's in the project, and this test is just a sanity check. Sometimes one little detail can make your program completely non-compliant with the specifications. You, you might not even see it, and it might cause a disaster in terms of grades. So the JUnit tests that we provide generally test only one thing, but it's really important. And if your code fails this most basic test, you can be pretty sure that your Proxer score will be really low. In the exam, when you finish a task, you must submit the task using a shell command. So let's practice that here. Here we'll try to submit the average SS project. We navigate to the project, then we run the command ant. Uh, you can see that your code is being compiled and tested, and then it is zipped up into an archive that will be delivered to Proxer for testing. Notice the warning message near the end. This is begging you to check the results of the JUnit test that is displayed just above. And if you think you have a good solution, but the JUnit test shows an error or a failure like this one, think again before you submit. Now, of course, if you're working with practice materials, the submission process does nothing. It will not send anything to Proxer. Uh, this is all private and your own work until you get into the, the real exam environment.
I hope this video has helped you get started and good luck on the exam.